change. You are the God you say you are when I'm afraid. You come and still my beating heart. You stay the same. When hope is just a distant thought, you take my pain and you lead me to the cross. What love is this that you gave your life for me? That was beautiful. Hey, as it has become our habit on World Mission Day, we've invited a missionary to come and speak to us about the work that God is using them in and how God is, is, is reaching his people where they are. A couple of years ago, we had Doug and Catherine Taylor who were from Uganda. Well, today we have somebody from a land just as, as, as distinctive and maybe even a little harder to reach. It's from Waxahachie. <laughs> it's easy for us to giggle about it, but the truth is, we live in a mission field, church. You realize we have 26 million people in the state of Texas, and many of them are lost. That's what led us a couple of years ago when Brother Steve and I were talking about planting churches. We said, you know what? Let's, let's get engaged in planting churches not just in foreign lands where it's easy to see they're lost, but in places closer to home 
When you read through Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus draws a schematic. Do missions locally first. So we wanted to plant a church here in Texas. And then go to the regional. So we wanted to plant one in the U.S. And then go overseas, Jesus says. So today, we've invited Aaron Clayton, pastor, to, pastor of Remedy Church, a new church start, a couple of years old now, in Waxahachie. He is a longtime friend of mine. And uh, when he started that church, I was pretty fired up because he's the kind of guy I'd want to serve with and serve under. So I know that you'll be blessed by he and his family. So I'd like to ask you to give him a central welcome and Aaron, come and speak to us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, if you would, grab your Bible and open up to Psalm chapter 67. That's going to kind of be mainly where we're at today, but we won't get to that um, for just a few minutes here. Um, Darren kind of asked me to come, and I'm really excited to be here, actually. Uh, me and Darren have known each other for a little while and uh, reconnected a couple years ago specifically about church planting um, at a, a conference called the Sin North America Conference. And so I'm just really pumped to be with you guys today. And uh, we've got really three things that we're trying to do, so we're going to be here all afternoon. Um, no, but we do have three things we're trying to do. So I love the season of Advent and the season of Christmas. Our church celebrates it. Um, we're sad to even not be there today. And so I really want to connect with the theme of joy. And it is a very real thing for us. And then secondly, it's World Missions Day. And we need to spend some time there. And then I want to tell you guys a little bit about what we're doing and invite you to come and be part of some of the things that we're doing it walks a hatchy Texas. And so Psalm 67, if you keep flipping, uh, keep opening there, mark your place, kind of hold that, and we'll get to that in just a second. So my name is Aaron Clayton. My wife, uh, Charity, is, uh, is here, and she's got two of our kids, Sam and Juliet, with her. And we have a third one, Valor, who's over in the nursery right now. And so we are planting a brand new church in Waxahachie, Texas, called Remedy Church. And as you might guess, a church plant, uh, you know, starting a brand new church from scratch with nothing looks and feels dramatically different than a church like this. And my roots are actually in some churches like this. And so even for me, it's really different. But it looks really wildly different. And we're what you would call a mobile church. And so... What that means is we don't have a building that we set everything up in like this and we stay and that's kind of where we operate. We meet on Sunday mornings in the Waxahachie YMCA. And so we have a big 20-foot trailer. You can kind of see some of our setup here. We drive across town, pick up the 20-foot trailer, and pull it to the YMCA and unload everything you see. Curtain, stage, screen, chairs, all the sound equipment, kids stuff, everything we do, we unload it, we set all of this stuff up, we worship in, in a lot of the same ways that we're doing here today, and then when we're all done, we tear all that stuff down, load it out back into the trailer, drive it across town and park it, and we leave it there until the next time. And so you see our setup a little bit. This is kind of what it looks like once we get rolling, when we got some people in the seats and, and kind of get meeting. And um, we have the next slide that's one of our kids' classrooms. And so we go into what's normally an aerobics room. It doesn't stink, but other than that, it does look like an aerobics room. So you show up in there. And we, we set up the curtains and the play panels and, and rugs on the floor and chairs and all this stuff. Kids meet in there. We have some really special things designed for them. The next one you'll see is the way we do baptism. Um, we don't have a nice fancy baptistry, so we have pool parties when we baptize people. And it's really great. Everybody brings food. We hang out and have a really good time. We've done a few of those when it's a little too cold to get outside in the pool. And so we've done that on Sunday morning in our worship gathering, and it's quite an adventure. Um, some stories of trying to set some things up so that we can baptize. And um, if you'll see a little bit later, I'm going to show a video of a girl named Shelby. We baptized her in a kiddie pool on Sunday morning. Dunked her, and it was a mess trying to get ready for that. But because of that, everything we do is mobile. I think there are some real drawbacks, but also some real strengths. So that nobody in our church is tempted to think that the church is the building. Because we don't have a building. I mean, everything we do revolves around the people and where we are. And so because of the way we're set up, a lot of the things we do are also pushed into homes. And that's this last picture here. And so much of what we do is families, moms and dads, kids, single people, grandparents. I mean, all up and down the spectrum, meeting in homes together for most of the things we did. And like last night, we just felt really honored 
to be received by a group of your people, to hear a little bit about what we're doing in Waxahachie and kind of let us share the vision a little bit. Um, and so they received us, and we sat in this really cool cafe that you guys have, and they got us dinner. But if we wanted to do anything like that, it would be in somebody's living room or maybe at a restaurant or something in town because everything we do is kind of moves around, and it really revolves around wherever we are. And so that's a, a little bit of what that looks like. Now, my roots are actually in churches like this. I went to high school in Terrell. Uh, Terrell, Texas, and, and so I went to First Baptist Church of Terrell. My mom and dad are still there, and so this really kind of uh, reminds me of home being here, especially around Christmas time, all the pageantry and the things that go with Christmas, and in our family, we love Christmas, and so I'll just put my cards on the table right now. I've been listening to Christmas music for about a month already. I get that thing fired up quick. You know, as soon as we're driving home from Thanksgiving, we got Christmas music queued up in the car, ready to go. We exercise some real restraint in our household, so we only put up two and a half Christmas trees, and we don't ever do them before Thanksgiving, okay? So for us, that's real restraint, but we have lots of get-togethers around Christmas time, make lots and lots of cookies. We've got a whole popcorn tin that's filled with hot chocolate, so if anybody comes over, I mean, you can just call me Buddy the Elf. We love Christmas. We love everything that revolves around it. And our kids, we really want to see them connect with the real themes of Christmas. I'm seeing this even with my daughter, Juliet, that when we started getting those decorations out, man, she was chomping at the bit. And so now everything we do, we have these Christmas mugs. She wants to drink out of a Christmas mug. So even if it's like, here, do you want some water? Yes, can I have it in a Christmas mug, please? And she'll drop a straw in it, but she's loving this. And so as we're seeing this happen, I really want my kids to connect with the real themes, the realities of what Christmas is, and not some of the shadows that maybe hopefully point to the realities, but to connect with it. And so we ask some questions, you know, like, what is Christmas really for? Why do we celebrate Christmas? And, and, and so we asked them this a few weeks ago, and they said, it's Jesus' birthday. And when we hear that, we're like, that's great, right? They're not so excited about presents or about Santa or that they're out of school or anything like that, but they're excited about Jesus. And it's a really good answer. But as we process that deeper and push into that, we celebrate the birthdays of everybody we know, don't we? I mean, everybody we know, and because of Facebook now, you can wish a happy birthday to people that you haven't seen since high school, and you talk to them in a way like they still run around with your crew, right? Because you know when everybody's birthday is, so you don't forget anybody. If you have a Starbucks card that's registered, you can get a free cup of coffee on your birthday every year, and that's open to everybody. So if you don't know it, go get one, register it, free cup of coffee. And birthdays are special to us, but they're common because everybody has one, right? And so what's so significant about this birthday? What makes Jesus' birthday Christmas when on my birthday I get to ride a stick horse around a restaurant and get a little miniature piece of cake and then I go to work the next morning, right? What makes his birthday so significant that everything we do in this kind of time of year really is ramped up so that everything kind of points to this thing? And it really goes to Matthew 121, what, what Matthew says to us there. It says, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. But we just got through singing about that the lost are saved at the sound of his name. So he will come and will redeem and will save his people from their sins. And so and when we say it's Jesus' birthday is what we celebrate, we're absolutely right when we say that. But when we leave it at just saying it's Jesus' birthday, there's so much that we leave in the box that we want to unpack for our family. We want to unpack these things for our kids. And so what we're teaching our kids, the answer to that question is, why do we celebrate Christmas? And now we're helping them learn to say, because Jesus came into the world to save us from our sins. What a joy that is for us. God kept his promise to send a rescuer. And in that, for us, there is great joy. Just like it says in Luke chapter 2. This is good news of great joy for all the people, right? And Isaiah chapter 9, we see a really familiar Christmas passage in verse 2. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. And look at this. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. Why? If you go a little farther down into verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is why we celebrate at Christmas. And so Christmas is for us a time of great joy. It's a time of receiving and reflecting on the incredibly good news that God has brought to us, that we've been rescued from sin, that we've been reconciled in relationship to God. 
And now we have hope where there was no hope. And we have the opportunity of peace where there was no peace. And he brings to us joy, not just happiness, like Darren said, but joy. All because of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And this is why we celebrate Christmas. It is reason for us to celebrate. And in the midst of all of those festivities, in the midst of the celebrations of hope and joy and everything that we celebrate at Christmas, there's this undercurrent running of something so much bigger than just those little things. Anybody play high school sports in here? I played basketball. Played lots of things. Basketball was really my favorite. And we had a pretty good team uh, when I was in high school. We had some really good players on our team. I won't say that I was one of them because I wasn't, but we did have some other good players on that team. And we had this really unique thing that would happen sometimes is that scouts would show up. College scouts would come to watch our games. And so when that happened, things would change a little bit. So we'd show up. We're just playing a normal game. We think we hope we win. If we don't, we go home. And everything kind of terminates with this one thing. But then usually when they were there, we'd find out about it maybe halftime or something like that, we'd realize they were there, that scouts were in the room, and we realized, hey, this one game is not all that's at stake here. There's a lot more riding on this for a lot of people here. There's something much bigger going on than just this little thing that we think we're involved in right now. And it's a really similar thing to what's happening at Christmas. All of this celebration and everything that we're doing in our families and as we celebrate in our churches, if we look deeper into these things, we see that Scripture is pointing to something much bigger than just our celebration here in Jacksonville, Texas, or at my house in Waxahachie, Texas. That scripture and the Holy Spirit is pointing to something so much bigger that is going on for us at this time of year. Well, what is that thing? Well, now, here's where we come to Psalm 67. I want you to look at me with verse 1. It says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. And so here you see this prayer asking for incredible blessing. And it seems a little strange, right? I mean, a lot of times we feel weird to ask for this kind of blessing. You know, maybe because of prosperity preaching or these kind of things, it feels a little strange to just say, God, would you just bless us immensely, more than we could possibly imagine, bless us. But yet you see this prayer here being prayed. And then you see the motivation for it. Right on its heels, the motivation for that request is the glory of God among all nations. And so we have this truth that God blesses us so that all nations will know his salvation. God blesses his people so that all nations will know his salvation. And listen here, God loves to answer that prayer. Look at verse 6. It says, the earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. So this is not saying that God always does that perfectly, but in his infinite wisdom, he knows what we need more than we do. But the reality is true that God loves to pour out blessing in a way that extends to the glory of his name. I heard another pastor say a great analogy, that if God's goal, if his desire is to get his resources and his glory to the nations, doesn't it make sense that he would put those resources into the back of a truck that is already going to the nations, Right? God loves to bless in ways that will bring glory and honor to his name. And he loves to answer that that prayer. He blesses us so that all nations will know his salvation. And so the question is, what does that mean about all that you have been blessed with? And all the things that I've been blessed with. Just process that for a minute. Of all the things that God's given us, everything that's at our disposal, why is that at our disposal? What is it that God's doing in giving those things to us? And then look at verse 3. It says, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Now, this is a funny verse, too. The word peoples there. You know, people is plural uh, of the singular person, and so it doesn't make sense that it would need an S. But the way he's using this word here is to refer to something singular, to one group of people. And so then he makes an S on it to say the groups of people. And so here he says, let the groups of people praise you, God. Let all the groups of people praise you. In Matthew 28, when Jesus says to go to all nations, that word nations there is ethne, the where we get our word for ethnic groups. And so when they refer to nations scripturally, they don't mean these national political countries and boundaries like we know today, but they mean all the different ethnic groups that live on the earth or what we have come to know as people groups. And so what he's saying here is let all the people groups, let all the ethnic groups praise you. So the destination of God's mission is not just Jacksonville or Waxahachie or my family. The destination of God's mission is every tribe and every language and every nation on the planet. 
That's the destination of where he wants this thing to go. Now, there are more than 16,000 people groups that live on this planet. More than 16,000. And it's around 7.1 billion people. And among those, we have some that we call unreached. Maybe you've heard this before. Really means that there's no viable Christian witness, that the church is either weak or just altogether absent in those places. So short story, it means those people have little to no access to the gospel. And so among these 16,000 plus people groups, more than 7,000 of them are what we considered unreached, with no access to the gospel. Almost 3 billion people living on the planet. That's almost 40% of the world population who's not only not believed in Jesus, but most of those people have never even heard of him before. We're getting ready to send a few couples from our church to, to live in Southeast Asia and to plant churches and do missionary work there, maybe for the rest of their lives. So as we're getting ready to send them, we've got some people who've gone. I got to go two Octobers ago, and we walked into these rural villages and literally sat down and had conversations with people who had no clue who Jesus is, had never heard of him before. I've got a friend who was just trekking across the mountainside and, and came into a village and talked to a guy, and they said, have you heard of Jesus? And he said, what kind of a thing is that? He didn't know if it was a person or a city or a food or a car. He had never heard of Jesus before and had no reference point. And so it's on that backdrop that we hear, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. And that's verse 4. It talks again about nations here, and it says, let the nations be glad. Let them sing for joy, this thing that we're celebrating at Christmas today, recognizing this thing that's happening here. Let them sing for joy. So he's talking about his glory, and then he transitioned to joy. Let the nation sing for joy. And so we see this thing to be true, that his praise and our joy go hand in hand. And so many people see them submitting their lives to Jesus as giving up their life, giving up their identity, giving up all the fun, right? Like if I come and follow Jesus, then I've got to get rid of all the beer commercial goodness, right? But it, like anybody even has that anyway, right? But, but when we come and follow Jesus, we're giving away all the good things in life and coming. And even though it may be good, it's not really going to be as much fun as what I've got now. We've got a couple of guys who've been a part of our church for a little while. Neither one of them believers. And they've come to our worship gathering. They've been in homes. They've had conversations. They've been around a good amount of time. And I've had conversations with each of these guys kind of on two separate occasions and said um, to these guys, you know, you know what's at stake here. And they're like, yeah, we, they know what we're saying, what we're asking. I said, what's keeping you from following Jesus? And both of these guys in two separate conversations said, I know what this means for me, and I'm not sure I'm ready to give those things up yet. Because they think that they're giving up life, not realizing that God instead is inviting them to come and to delight themselves in him. They think they're giving up joy and giving up happiness, not realizing that God is, is asking them to finally come and actually find happiness. That he wants to give it to them. In Psalm 1611, it says, you make known to me the path of life. Who doesn't want that, right? Make known to me the path of my life. In, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you believe that? Does the way you live your life show that you believe that? Do the decisions you make, do they reflect that in your life? Or maybe for you, you've been searching for joy, or you've been searching for hope, or searching for some reason to finally have peace, and you never found it in all the things you've tried, and for you, it's time to consider Jesus. And there's no better day to do it than when we're talking about joy in the season of Advent. This good news of great joy that we see in Luke and Isaiah is for all people. It's for everyone. In Isaiah chapter 49, 6, it says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring, that to bring back the preserved of Israel. So it's too small a thing that you should have this message just for this one nation of people. He said, I will make you as a light for the nations. That my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And you see, Jesus, after his resurrection, he gives the great commission, right? Sends his followers out into every nation to make disciples. In Mark chapter 16, he says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That Jesus is sending us to all nations. And so we see this reality true. That God blessed them and he blessed us so that all nations would know his salvation for his glory and for our joy. That God blessed them and he has blessed us so that all nations would know his salvation for his glory and for our joy. 
And so at this time of Christmas, as we're celebrating that Jesus came to to rescue us from sins, it is a time for great joy. And we should out-celebrate the world. We should throw all the best parties at this time of year. We should make the best ham and the best cookies and the best coffee. And we should celebrate in ways that don't go overboard and do things that are sinful. But we ought to celebrate in ways that they are like, they have something to really celebrate. This is not just about the office Christmas party for them. That they are celebrating something huge. We should out-celebrate the world at this time of year. They give ourselves to it. But in the middle of this, there are reminders that this joy is not just for us, that it's for all peoples. Many of these people who are far from God. And God wants all of these people to hear his salvation, to hear this good news of great joy. And if that's true, then the question to us is, what are we doing to leverage our lives for that infinite purpose? If the reality is true that God wants all peoples to hear of his salvation, and we are his people, we are his church, the ones who have been blessed to be a blessing Then the question comes to me and to my church and to every one of you sitting here today, what are we doing to leverage every piece of our existence for the glory of God among all people? He's laid that challenge out ahead of us. And so I want to take just these last few minutes to talk about how we're trying to do that at Remedy Church. A little over three years ago, the pastor at a church I was on staff at the time said, we've been praying, we'd like for you and your wife to pray about going to plant a church in Waxahachie. And we've been thinking a lot about church planting, praying about it for a while, thought that, you know, that could be down the road somewhere, but didn't really know what that looked like. i never thought about Waxahachie. It's only about 30 minutes away from where we were at the time and a smaller town than we were in, just hadn't even considered it. So over the next couple of months, we prayed about it, had some real conversations, went and spent some time praying, uh, eating, talking to people in Waxahachie. And over that period, we really felt like God was leading us there, that leading our family to go and to start a new church in Waxahachie. And so on September 11th, 2011, uh, 15 of us, 12 adults and three kids, had our very first meeting in the upstairs living room of one of the families on our team. And it's all just grown from there. Now, maybe similar to Jacksonville, there are dozens of churches in Waxahachie. And so we get the question all the time, even still today, why start another church in a town with dozens of churches? And it's really a fair thing. It's really a fair question. It's a great conversation. I'd love to have with anybody that wants to have it. But the short answer is we feel like we're planting a different kind of church. And so I want to lay out just a little piece of our model for you. Almost every church has a gathering, right? Almost every church gathers and does the kinds of things that we're doing here today. And then for every one of those churches, there are lots and lots and lots of people who are not a part of that thing, who are on the outside looking in. Right, And so our typical response as the church, now a lot of churches are unaware that those people are even there. But for churches who have have kind of dialed into that, our usual response is to try to plan some things so that those people can hear the gospel. And then invite those people to come and see and hear the things that we're doing. And what we see that over time kind of is happening is that the people who are willing to take that invitation is slowly uh, decreasing. And we have what we call the shrinking 40%. It's first released by a man named Alan Hirsch. But it's basically a national survey that says about 40% of the people uh, that live in our nation are open to an invitation to church, or they're at least not hostile to it. Now let's stop for a minute. That's not a small thing. That's 40% of the people that live around us who might come if we invited them. And so we should be inviting, right? But then on the other side, there are 60% of the people that live around us who are unlikely to ever come to a church. It doesn't matter what we're doing. It doesn't matter if it's contemporary or traditional, Sunday school or small groups, if you've been around for a long time, if you're a church plant, if it's a cowboy church, it doesn't matter. It's just irrelevant to them. They're just uninterested in church. And that doesn't mean they're not asking the same questions people have always been asking or that they are searching for the same answers. They're looking for those same things. They just don't see the church as a viable place to find those answers anymore. And so we see less and less that people will come. And so we're back to we have the gathering and all those kind of people out of it. And there are a lot of churches who are are strategizing and trying to figure out how do we reach those people? How do we invite them in? And so we said, what are we going to do about the other 60? The people who are unlikely to ever darken the doors of our church events. How are we going to reach those people? And so our response to it has been to say, let's plant what we call missional communities. That rather than inviting everybody to come in, although we still do that, but that we would intentionally be sending people out to go live out the gospel all (coughs) day 
excuse me, all during the week where these people already live and do work and have families. And so we call our missional communities these things. They're smaller groups of people who go with the gospel and live out the things that we talk about on Sundays together in community where people already live. And they try to incarnate the gospel to these people who are never going to come into the churches and hear these things from us. And so we really look at that big picture and say our gathering and our missional communities, all of that is Remedy Church. And both of those things are absolutely vital to what we're trying to do, that we need them both. And so there's kind of this healthy gathered and sent rhythm that we're a gathered people and we worship and we hear the word of God and we celebrate the things that God is doing and we light joy candles in remembrance of all that God has done, that it's vitally important that we gather and do these things. And equally important that we go out and live as a sent people, carrying those things with us into the world that God has called us to reach. It's kind of like breathing. If you always only ever breathe in, you'll die. And if you always only ever breathe out, you'll die. But it's a healthy rhythm of breathing in and breathing out. And it's similar to the church, that we need to be gathered. And we need to to come together and worship and celebrate and be with one another. And then we need to be sent. We need to be scattered and go and live these things out together as the church. And then as we do that, it's our hope that we'll be able to plant these things, new expressions of this in new churches, in places where people are not being reached. And the ultimate goal of that, being planting churches like this, among some of the least reached peoples on the planet. Like I said earlier, we're getting ready to send our first two couples to go and start a work like this in Southeast Asia. We're really excited about that. And so in our model, we place a really high priority on relationships and community. Or to say it another way, we place a really high priority on life together. That when we're gathered, we do things together. And when we're scattered and sent, we also go together that we don't go as individuals. So we place a high priority on mission and disciple making and doing that together in community. And so we see the most effective way for those things to happen is for you to do them in the context of a community of other believers, people who walk with you in that and make disciples. It's great to be making disciples when you have somebody with the gift of evangelism and somebody else who is a wooer and draws a crowd like my wife and some other people who are great at gospel conversations and other people who are great at hosting. They would never talk to a stranger, but they make people feel so welcome when they show up. And you put all those people together and you see the body of Christ living out the mission in a really healthy, holistic way. And so we value that in a really big way. We use the term spiritual family on mission a lot. And then we really place a high priority on involvement in our city. Being involved in the stream of life of our city, not kind of having a parallel Remini Church culture that does some of our own things parallel to the life of the city, but how do we get into the things that the city is doing? Because if we want to see the gospel change our city, we believe that we are going to have to be present in our city with the gospel. And so the last thing I want to do is just show you a video of one of the girls that we've um, connected with. Her husband's name is Alex. Her name is Shelby. I met Alex a few weeks after we moved to Waxahachie and got to talk, and he eventually starts following Jesus and starts bringing her around, and she didn't want anything to do with it. You could tell when she was there she did not want to be there, didn't want to hang out with what she called glitter Christians. She thought we were all fake. And one night, she's at one of our ladies' nights, and they're talking about living with the gospel, but life is hard. And they're being really honest and vulnerable about all the mistakes they're making and how they're they're learning, but it's just difficult. And she finally realizes these people are a lot like me. That was kind of the crack in the dam. And from there, um, everything really just happened after that. So I want you to just see a little bit of her story. could just tell her story. <clears throat> Shell, yeah, right. I can't hear it either. It's not just you. <laughs> Shelby, um, like I said, is Alex's wife. Uh, they live three doors down from us. I met Alex on Halloween and started a relationship with him. Well, he comes, starts following Jesus, and so Shelby comes with him. And she starts showing up at all of our stuff, but she had grown up in a real difficult background, actually going to church but in a really hostile family that lived a certain way at home and then showed up at church and was, was literally saying, you better clean this stuff up, we're at church now. Stop the crying, stop all that other stuff, we're at church. And it just turned her off to Christianity. And so then she starts hanging out with our people, calling us glitter Christians, 
thinking that everything we do is fake, that we just act this way when we're around people, but life at home is a mess, just like she had seen. And one night, she's at this, this ladies' night with some of our ladies, and one lady just starts confessing, like, I've been spending way too much money. Like, I don't think I can stop spending money. And somebody else is confessing all the struggles that they've had with kids at home and how they have not been doing a good job with that. And someone else saying, it's really hard for me to be nice to my husband. And just being really honest and vulnerable, like we love Jesus, we want to follow him, but we don't know what all the answers are here. And she started looking around going, these people are just like me. And so it all kind of started from there. And she started hanging around, and my wife got a hold of her. My wife is a much better church planter than I am. And she starts spending time with her, investing in her, studying the Bible together with her, and Shelby comes to faith. And so we baptized her. I mentioned earlier the little kiddie pool. You see this here. We baptized her in the kiddie pool, and the water was ice cold. We dunked her. She jumped out of there and was, like, ready to run. And what's really cool, so we baptized her two Easter's ago, and this past Easter she baptized Lauren. We baptized her together. Lauren was her across-the-street neighbor. So Shelby came to faith. Her and Alex start living out the mission of God in their neighborhood. And then here Lauren comes to faith. And we baptized her last Easter. Well, guys, this is what it's about. And then that God has blessed us so that all nations, whether it's Waxahachie or Jacksonville or to the ends of the earth, so that all nations would know his salvation for his glory and for our joy. And so it's imperative in the midst of that that we pray, that we ask the Lord to reveal himself to people, to soften people's hearts and to save them, that we ask God to be about the work of doing that. It's imperative that we pray those things. It's imperative that we give lavishly, and I chose that word on purpose, that we would lavish the things that God has given us so that we could fund his mission, that we would pour out the things God given us with generosity and with, with sacrifice for his glory and for his mission. And then thirdly, it's imperative that we live out the mission of God, not just kind of going on mission, but as ambassadors for this king, right? Making his salvation known, giving up our vacation and spending our own money and doing things that are uncomfortable for us. And for some of you, that will mean the United States. Maybe it's coming to serve with us in Waxahachie, and we want to invite you to come and do that. Maybe it's San Francisco, or, or maybe it's some other place. For some of you, it's going to be overseas, going to the ends of the earth with the gospel. Some of you on a trip for a short period of time. Maybe some of you, God's calling to give your life to live somewhere in a place that is dark and to invest the gospel to see people come to know him and expand the glory of God. For all of us, God's given us neighbors. He's given us coworkers. He's given us families that we live in, and he's entrusted us with his gospel. He's entrusted us with his resources that we would take it and make much of him among all of those people for his glory and for our joy and for their joy, that they would know him and come to follow him and be filled with the joy of Christmas, people who've never heard of it before, people who want no part of it right now, that they would surrender their lives to it. And so in knowing Darren and even in just the short time that I'm getting to know your church here, I just want to say really clearly, I'm encouraged by what you guys are doing, really encouraged by what you're doing. And I want to leave you just with the challenge to be relentless in those things and not just do them as a once a year deal or in spurts or as it's convenient or comfortable for you, but to be relentless in living out the mission of God, to leverage your entire existence for the glory of God and for the joy of all people. I want to pray for you guys. Thank you so much for having me today. God, we do love you. We thank you that you have granted us joy in our hearts and that you've given us the gospel, that we don't wander around aimlessly anymore. God, that you've given us hope and you've given us peace and direction and purpose. God, that you have called us to come and to be yours. And as we sit under these things today, God, I pray that you would open up our eyes to see those around us who have, have maybe heard a distorted picture of who you are. And that they, what they think they know is not the true God or the true gospel. And we pray that you would use us to be light in dark places. I want to ask that you would use Central Baptist Church to be light among some of the darkest places on this planet. Some of those are right here in Texas. God, I pray that you would use them for your glory. That we would find joy in the redemption we have in Jesus. Joy in living on your mission. And finally see pleasures at your right hand forevermore when we give our whole lives to you. God, we thank you that you've granted us life. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Change my heart, oh God.